Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Excited to see you all. I am going to do an update from the most recent adult and adolescent treatment guidelines from the Department of Health and Human Services. Two weeks ago, Sharisha focused on an update of what to start, the ART regimens for initial therapy, and she showed the data, particularly for the dolutegravir lamivudine combo pill, which has been added. What I'm going to do is summarize the other sections of the guidelines that have been updated so that you are aware of what's new and where you can find it. Some of this will be review for you. I always think review is okay, and I'll, I'll make some highlights and then point out the resources so you can go into the guidelines and look at these sections in more detail if you like. So with that, let's just talk about what all is new and updated in the guidelines. Here is a list of the sections that have been either added or updated, and... The link at the bottom is where you can find these and other guidelines. So if you are newer to HIV care, it's worth just going, checking out these links. Uh, this has resources such as adult and adolescent treatment guidelines, the pediatric treatment guidelines, PEP, PrEP, OIs, and everything. They're big documents, but they have nice links, nice tables. And if you go, for example, to the adult treatment guidelines, there's a nice summary on the front page of what is new. And so I'm just going to go through again each section and highlight some of the new additions, the changes, the new language, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers before we turn to cases. So first, there is a new section on treatment as prevention and U equals U or undetectable equals untransmittable. We've talked about the data and those messages here before certainly worthwhile to become familiar with the data and the messaging around these things, especially U equals U. So if you haven't looked at it, certainly would look at the U equals U website and data. The guidelines panel has added this language that a consistent viral load below 200 copies per milliliter prevents, the underlining is mine, prevents transmission of HIV to sexual partners. I personally was happy to see that they used such strong, clear language. They didn't say effectively prevents prevents or essentially prevents or anything like that. They clearly say consistent viral load below 200 prevents transmission of HIV to sexual partners. This section is really meant to help integrate this messaging and this data into clinical practice. So they add some of these important statements to emphasize to patients in your clinic. For example, we should be informing persons with HIV about treatment as prevention, about U equals U, and really, this can be a tool to encourage ART adherence and also to remind individuals about the risk of transmission during periods off ART. So again, this allows us to really stress to individuals in our clinics the importance of ART adherence, maintaining a suppressed viral load, and how dramatically that decreases the likelihood of transmitting to others. They highlight that persons starting ART should use another form of prevention for at least six months and until the HIV RNA is documented to be below 200 copies. And we should certainly be reminding individuals in our clinics or offices that ART for HIV prevention does not prevent bacterial STIs and prioritize prevention for all the bacterial STIs and regular STI screening. I'm sure all of you know about how frequent we are seeing syphilis. I'm sure that's coming up a lot in your clinics as well. And certainly we should be emphasizing to everyone that although ART and a suppressed viral load prevents transmission of HIV to others, of course, other protective measures are needed to prevent syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and bacterial STIs. In terms of when to start, this section has been updated. The panel emphasizes the importance of screening early diagnosis of HIV and starting ART immediately or as soon as possible in order to achieve these goals, increasing the uptake of ART, decreasing time for linkage to care and viral suppression, reducing risk of HIV transmission, and improving rates of virologic <coughs> suppression. There is an interesting, very small number of sentences about same-day start. So that's the idea of starting ART either the same day as diagnosis, or I think what comes up for us often in clinic is do we start ART at the first clinic visit? Sharisha has reviewed uh, the data behind same-day ART and talked about some of the <coughs> logistical difficulties. There certainly can be logistical difficulties in terms of uh, getting insurance coverage for ART and just gearing up all of the support systems to help somebody start ART on the first day. What 
I would say is that certainly starting as soon as possible or as soon as feasible makes a lot of sense. And this really is where the pendulum has swung. We no longer uh, routinely wait for genotype results or wait till somebody's had multiple clinic visits. It is okay to start ART as soon as possible. And the guidelines committee sort of highlights that there can be logistical difficulties. And so starting when possible makes sense and is supported. So for example, if you're seeing somebody in your clinic, either same day as diagnosis or first visit, you can start gearing them up to start ART as soon as there's coverage available, as soon as possible, even within a few days or the first week. Do not have to wait for genotype results and we'll come back to uh, that point again in a minute. The panel also emphasizes the importance of immediate ART in certain situations, like for acute or early HIV infection. There also may be other scenarios where starting right away is really clinically beneficial um, for a number of opportunistic infections. As we've talked about, we want to start ART as soon as possible for somebody in pregnancy, especially late pregnancy, somebody with acute HIV. Absolutely, those situations become very high priority to start ART immediately. But really for anyone coming into clinic, ready to start ART, we now really, if they're ready, gear them up to start as soon as possible. These are the recommendations Ashrisha reviewed and went into the data about two weeks ago. So just as a reminder, uh, we're reviewing the update from the Department of Health and Human Services just updated last month. And these are the recommendations for first-line therapy. So Bictegravir, FTC, TAF, uh, Dolutegravir, Abacavir, Lamivudine, if somebody's B5701 negative, Dolutegravir plus FTC, TAF, or FTC, TDF, or Raltegravir plus those NRT options. And then Ashrisha reviewed the update was the addition of Dolutegravir, Lamivudine, with the caveats. This has really only been studied as initial therapy if someone's viral load is below 500,000. It is absolutely crucial to make somebody, sure somebody does not have active hepatitis B. And the one note here is this is one situation where the panel recommends having baseline genotype results before starting. So based on our discussion two weeks ago, what I heard consensus here and around our community was really no one's reaching for this routinely for initial therapy. There's no reason you couldn't if these criteria are met but it seems like we all are much more comfortable using this as a switch or maintenance strategy after somebody's suppressed for the person with no hep B, you know, no resistance to those meds as opposed to using it for initial therapy. So the other thing I, I heard two weeks ago is I think a lot of us were a little bit surprised this made it to initial preferred therapy as opposed to a, an option for sort of unique circumstances. And I think when we've talked before, really most of us are reaching for Bictegravir, FTC, TAF, or Dolutegravir with FTC TAF as our first line therapy for most individuals. This is just a reminder of the IAS USA guidelines, the other guidelines committee in this country. Their guidelines have not been updated since July 2018, so have not been updated to incorporate dolutegravir lamivudine, the, the dual therapy option. So we'll see how they incorporate that. The only main difference here is they do not include raltegravir as an option, and they really emphasize that we should be, in most instances, reaching for TAF instead of TDF. And I think, in reality, that's what most of us do. So that is the summary of the update to the what to start initial regimen options. The other point that's been updated in the guidelines is if you are starting ART before genotype results are available, again, that is very reasonable to do in all circumstances, especially if there's a high priority clinical situation to start immediately, then what we should be reaching for is a high barrier to resistance <coughs> integrase inhibitor like Bictegravir or Dolutegravir or a high barrier resistance agent like boosted darunavir plus two NRTIs. Generally, these will be emtricitabine and tenofovir or TAF. Usually would not reach for a Bacavir, for example, in this scenario because you have to do HLA-B5701 testing and because it is more susceptible to various resistance mutations like 184V. And again, I think in most situations where we're starting ART before we have the genotype result, we're reaching for one of these first two. I think often this first one, and if someone doesn't have insurance coverage for it, then the second option would be Dolutegravir FTC TAF. So that's the update. And really the only change here is that BIC FTC TAF was added to that list of recommended options while you're waiting for genotype results. There is some new language in the guidelines on weight gain with ART. We've reviewed this data. We've talked about how controversial this is and how kind of messy the data is and no one really knows the clinical implications. So I just put here the language. There are these two sentences that were added. One data from studies showing increased weight gain with particular ARV medications exist, including some INSTIs. A side note, and we've reviewed mostly that's dolutegravir as well as TAF, especially in certain patient populations. And then also this note that there are now data suggesting greater weight gain with certain integrase inhibitor-based regimens in TAF than with other ARV drugs. And then the clinical significance of these findings is still unknown. I think that's the most crucial point. And so the, the italics here I added. So again, we've reviewed this data. 
It's out there. No one really knows what to make of it. I'm finding it's not changing a lot of my clinical decision making, though I have had instances where I'm considering switching or considering options and I'm informing patients that there is some data about this out there. Uh, this came up for me in clinic recently talking about prep options and Truvada versus Descovy, and we don't really know what to do with the weight change data with TAF. So I, it has informed my the way I educate patients about options, but I really haven't found this to be changing my clinical decision making, at least at this time. But I'd be curious how this, how you're incorporating this into your practice. And I wanted to show you this new language from the guidelines. So hopefully we'll learn more and have more specific guidance around that in the future. Here's the update to dolutegravir and neural tube defects or dolutegravir for individuals with childbearing potential. We've reviewed this data as well, and this is a fairly major update to the guidelines. Remember the last iteration based on the data that came out of Botswana, the guidelines committee really said we should not be uh, recommending prescribing dolutegravir for people of childbearing potential or people who might conceive. Here's a reminder about the data updated from the Sepamo study in Botswana. The prevalence of neural tube defects in instances in which dolutegravir was taken at time of conception was estimated to be 0.3%, statistically still higher than non-dolutegravir ART, most of which was a favarins, but the absolute difference was pretty small and the important caveats that this data came from a country that does not fortify their food supply with folate and an increased incredibly small percentage of women in this trial were receiving full supplementation <coughs> prior to conception. So we have to acknowledge those caveats. So the revised updated recommendations are that Dolutegravir is considered an alternative ART uh, for persons of childbearing potential or trying to conceive. So it's gone from not recommended to an alternative. And I take that to be, it, it is a reasonable option as long as we are informing patients about what is known and unknown and the potential risks and benefits. And then just a reminder of what the guidelines list as preferred options in that scenario. And then they do now list Dolutegravir as recommended if a person is using effective contraception. And I just wanted to remind you of the update from the perinatal guidelines, and Hillary had reviewed this for everyone, but just a reminder that the perinatal guidelines also list dolutegravir as an alternative option for women who are trying to conceive, again, with shared decision-making, uh, information about risks and benefits, but now as a preferred option for pregnant women, regardless of trimester. Other sections that have been updated, so just a quick review, there's more detail in the guidelines and I refer you to those sections. To look at this in more detail and happy to talk about this more, plan discussions on this at future ECHO sessions. So there, there are updates to the section on HIV in the older person and the biggest points to emphasize are don't forget screening and diagnosis. ART, early ART and ART overall is especially important for older individuals due to higher risk of serious non-AIDS complications blunted CD4 responses. These, if you will, geriatric syndromes are very common amongst our patients. They may occur at younger ages and may require a team-based approach to help address polypharmacy, multimorbidity, and frailty. Decline in neurocognitive function is faster in older individuals, and so we should be considering and screening older individuals in our clinic for both depression and for HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders. A reminder that on the National Curriculum site, there is a link in a really nice format for going through the screening tool for HAND. I use that in my clinic, and I think we've sent that link out before, but we certainly can again. And then finally, there are updates to a section on cost. I would encourage you to read this. I will tell you my take home message, which is it's really complicated and it is not as simple as there are generics available and coming and costs are decreasing. It is way more complicated than that. For example, some generic ARVs we already have. There are other generic ARVs coming like FTC TDF. However, the cost savings from some of these generics are moderate. It depends on how widely they're being manufactured. It depends on a lot of other factors. It's also very hard to know the true cost of brand name drugs. There are discounts, there are rebates. A lot is done behind closed doors and is not transparent. And then I just thought this, this I pulled this out of the guidelines because I thought this was informative in terms of why these issues are so complicated. They state in cases where manufacturer copay assistance may be available for a brand name ARV product, but not for an equivalent generic, the generic drug prescription paradoxically may result in higher out-of-pocket costs. So again, I don't think there are any really clear calculations when it comes to generic ARVs and how they are going to affect cost. I think that we will have to see how things like generic FTC TDF coming uh, in the next 
I would say two years will affect things. And I encourage you to read this section, but that is what I took away from it. It's complicated and hard to make any really simple messages to patients in our clinic about generics. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.